everyone, my name is Tara Acosta and welcome to the Street Smart Side of Business. Today we're welcoming Bill Boyle. Bill is the owner of Federal Prison Consulting, so please join me in welcoming him. Hi Tara, Hi. how are you doing? Good to see you. It's good to be seen. Yeah. It's very good to be seen. Absolutely. That's an interesting choice of words. Yeah. yeah. So I figure we'll get right into it. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit about your new business venture. So Federal Prison Consulting, yeah. um, it's, it's a niche, a specialty. It's basically a highly uh, specialized uh, knowledge that no one ever wants to know, but it's so important to learn it if you get in trouble with the federal government. And one of the things that I learned is that it's even more important for the families, not so much the person that's in trouble going to prison, yeah. but it's a way of helping relieve anxiety. Because really, it comes down to everybody's anxious. The yeah. family's anxious maybe more so than the prisoner, the person going to prison. So it's, it's highly specialized knowledge that would just teach you things. How to act, how not to act, things to do, things that are acceptable, not acceptable. And um, it makes it for a much smoother entry yeah. and a smoother transition when you come out the other side. Yeah. So like in, in your situation, you know, you have you have a family. Yeah. And, you know, what you were you were facing federal prison time and I'm sure that was super scary for you, but as to your point and for them, you know, you're you're yeah family is trying to figure out like what's going to be happening how you know visitation and what they can provide you with and all that kind of stuff so like what you're doing is basically providing a lot of insight for them yeah it's a complete manual it's yeah. it's a manual of you know what to do a month before what to do two days before a week before whatever how to set yourself up so when you get there it's a smooth entry but importantly, like I, my first day there, I said to a guard, you know, how do I turn the phone on? And his response was, how the F do I know? I don't use it. Good talk, buddy. Yeah, thanks for the help. <laughs> you know, so if I can help make that transition smooth, yeah. and it just takes away a lot of anxiety for everybody, especially the family, if they'll know when, how long it's going to take to get into visit. Sometimes you're lucky, you get in the first weekend. Sometimes the guards don't want to do the paperwork, so they throw your paperwork on the side and it might take a month to get yeah. visitation approved. Yeah. So these things that you have to know in advance, it just helps, it takes away a lot of anxiety. And that's why I wanted to do it because I know what my family went through and I know what I went through. Yeah. And it's terrifying. Yeah, I'm sure. So let's, let's talk about what got you there. Mm -hmm. So your career um, previously, before yeah. this entrepreneurial new adventure, uh, you were a financial advisor, yep. and you made a career out of that for a long time. Yeah, I was a financial advisor for about 25 years, and it was good, it was lucrative, I enjoyed it. I used to tell people, you know, if your heart stops beating, I can't help you, but if your financial heart stops beating, I can help you. Yeah. And it was nice to sit at a table and help people with retirement plans and college funding, things like that. I really, I became friends with these people. You know, even to this day, there's people that I was an advisor to that I'm just friends with. Um, I enjoyed it. It was great. I went out on my own, did very well. And then I decided, you know what, this business is, it's changing. It's evolving and I'm not liking what I see where it's going. And I needed a new challenge. So what does any Irishman do? Buys a bar. Buys a bar. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that explains it. So yeah. you, you were ready to... Spice it up a little bit. Just, I mean, that's a completely opposite world from a yeah. financial advisor. Yeah. Did you know anything about running a bar? Nah, my father owned a bar for 35 years. So I did know a little bit, but when he had a bar, it was, you know, just Jack wins vodka. Right. That was it. Today, it's so different. Yeah, probably uh, cash business. It was all cash. There was no credit cards. No one ever had a credit card back in the early 70s, mid 70s. Right. So it was different, but I saw a failing business down South Street, and I thought, you know what, this is it. I can change this around. Also, I wanted to show my children what it takes to be successful and how you have to build a business. Yeah. So I thought it could be a learning tool for them as well. Now, the issue is you need money to do that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to necessarily tap my 401k or whatever, and I knew I could have clients that had plenty of money available. My 
downfall and to, to my regret to, to be my dying day is the fact that I wasn't honest with the people. Had I just said to them, listen, I want to borrow the money for this. Yeah. They would have said, sure, Bill. Yeah. But instead I'm like, oh, we're going to do this and this. Truth be told, if they looked at their Charles Schwab statement, they couldn't tell you what was in there anyway. Right. I took advantage of someone's trust and that was my downfall and that's something that bothers me to this day. Yeah. And it just wasn't right, And but I did it. I paid the price. I spent 1,547 days in federal prison for it. And I'm now on the other side of it. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's a testament to the human spirit. Can I ask, like, why didn't you, it, you know, perhaps take out a business loan or take that approach? That's a great question, Tara. Um, something that you as a, a friend and all my friends didn't know was that I also was struggling with a 20 year Percocet addiction. And I was completely private person and anyone's addicted is private like that. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'm taking these pills. I'm Superman. I can do anything I want. You know, I can do this. I deserve it, whatever. And I just, the approach was the easiest way possible. Right. I didn't want to do the hard work. Right. And that's what happens when you're an addict. Yeah. You want to skate along and do the least amount of work possible. Yeah. And that's where I was in my life. And that really, that says a lot because, you know, I know you to be an educated, successful businessman. So, you know, for you to make a decision like that as the person that you are, you know, it's, it's, it was pretty shocking to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, understanding that, you know, there, there was an addict mentality behind it, unfortunately does speak volumes. Right, I mean, that's, when you look at it like that, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense all of a sudden to people who didn't know, they're all questioning, how the hell did Boyle end up in prison? Yeah. And then yeah. after I come out with it and said, well, here's the problem, ah, the light bulb went on. Yeah. And all of a sudden then people were saying, I did notice something that wasn't right. I didn't. It was the little things, right? You know. Yeah. But yeah. I was a complete functioning addict. Yeah. Um, and that's what we don't think of. Like we think of addicts as non-functioning, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. and that you know, this is something that happens in a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. um, I met, I met a man. I was going to do haircuts for the homeless, and in Kensington, and he was panhandling. And, you know, and he looked, he looked pretty clean cut, like he hadn't been on the streets very long. And I was like, oh, like, what are you doing? What's your right. story? And, he, you know, he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, why are you here? Like, look at you, like you look, you don't belong here. Right. And, you know, he got into telling me that he was a mortgage broker that ended up with a Percocet addiction that ended up with oxys and then to heroin. And he lost his house, his fiance, his car, and he was on the streets of Kensington panhandling. Yeah. I mean, it's when you look at it that way, addiction itself, very similar story to me. Thank God. Well, I did. I lost everything. The reality of it is I lost everything and had to start over. And I'm okay with that. It's my own doing. And I'm thankful for it because now I'm grateful for everything I do or have. But when you're talking about how you look at a person and it doesn't, doesn't match up, I was very lucky that I didn't go on to bigger pills. I was addicted to five milligram Percocet. And I'm not trying to say that that's a good thing, it's just what it is, but it's terrible. But I can remember, you know, I was the guy in a suit would go to my doctor and say, you know, I got a little bit of ear pressure pain. Can you write me a prescription? Well, I'm a guy in a suit. I don't look like a guy at K and A. Right. So he's like, sure, Bill, no problem. Yeah. One of the doctors I used played baseball with my son. We'd be out on a Saturday or Sunday at a game and I'd say, you know, I got a sinus infection, I think. I said, are they waiting for him? Sure, but let me go to my car and get a prescription pad. Yeah. Like, if you don't look the part sometimes, no one knows, they don't question it. And if you can have that persona of, I'm not a street addict or a street right. junkie, people treat you different. They do treat you different. And yeah. honestly, I feel like at this point in time, it's a little different because there's been so yeah. much light, like, shined on the opioid epidemic. Right. Um, doctors aren't so quick to do that anymore because we know how addictive and how like life altering painkillers can be and opioids can be. Yeah. So, I mean, just the fact that you were able to kind of function at that level on just those pills without 
going to the next level of drugs, I mean, it, it, it still ruined your life. Right, yeah. For that period of time. And I can remember, Ty, um, I can remember this night clear as day. The time I was going to take a client, I knew I was going to grab a check off him for $180,000. And I knew I was lying to him. And I can remember five minutes, I timed it out. About 10 minutes before I went to their house, I took one. And by the time I got to their house, I'm feeling like Superman. I'm invincible. I can do nothing wrong. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, Jimmy, just sign that there. I'll take it. No problem. All right, Bill, yeah. Here's a guy I've been to his daughter's wedding, been to his mother's funeral. I've been to christenings. And I abuse the trust. And that's what addicts do. Yeah. And yeah. it's heartbreaking. And look you straight in the eye yeah. and do it. Oh, yeah. The, you know, they took my rights away. I can't own a gun. I told the judge, I said, if you really want to punch me, take away the pen. I committed more crimes with a pen than I did a gun. Yeah, seriously. You know? Seriously. It is what it is. So, like, you know, so you, how, how was your experience in prison, like, once you kind of got settled in and whatnot? Let's talk about that a little bit. It's federal prison, there's, there's different levels. There's very high level security. There's super max where you can't leave your cell ever, ever. There's a high level, medium, low. I was in a low and then I was lucky enough to get to a camp. I was at Fort Dix low, you're behind a fence. My experience was decent because I had a lot of Italian friends that cooked me a lot of good food every day. And I just was with a good group of people. Um, so it wasn't terrible. The other thing is it's not like TV or the movies, you know, they're private showers, there's private bathrooms. You're not hanging out, you know, showering with 20 other guys checking you out all I the time. I mean, I'm just hearing what you're saying about cooking and like, I'm like, mm -hmm. you didn't have a tray and someone slaps some slop in your bowl and... Well, you did if you went to the, the um, chow hall. Okay. But because the Italians, all from New York City, would buy all the food. So we had fresh vegetables and peppers and Can meats. You, that's available in prison? Well, for the right price. Okay. You know, on the black market, just about anything. That's oh, the other okay. thing. You know, there's booze. So like there's not, booze. not through prison. No, well, yeah, it's not, not, it's not it's like the actual like, prison. Yeah, it's like what's being. It wasn't sanctioned. Okay. <laughs> Let's say gotcha. that. It wasn't a sanctioned event. Yes. So, but it's weird. Like I can remember one day a guard comes into our room and we had these lockers. That's where you kept all your stuff. And the, the guard opens up one of the lockers and there's five gallons of peppers. Okay. There's cooking utensils, everything. And the guard's like, and he knew he came right to our room because he had heard a story or whatever. <laughs> and he goes, I'm not even pissed off about so much shit being in here. I want to know how to, they snuck all this shit out of my cafeteria. Seriously. Yeah. And, so, and he left everything. Right. He just like, he's like, I ain't going to fight with this because I know it's going to happen again tomorrow right. or the next day. He says, but how are we not patting these guys down? Because they're supposed to pat the kitchen workers down, make sure they don't have anything. But we literally had the bowls and the plates that the guards ate off of <laughs> in our lockers, like nice stuff. It was kind of bizarre. And it did make my experience not terrible. Yeah. You know, I mean, I became friendly with these people. They were nice. Um, you know, you have to watch out. I mean, who you you become friends with. I mean, there's a hierarchy to certain crimes. You don't affiliate with certain people right. if they committed certain crimes. But if you have what they call clean paperwork, mm -hmm. which I did, mm -hmm. meaning you didn't rat on anybody and you didn't hurt a child, if you have that, you're okay. Right. And I didn't have either of those things. Right. But I did fit the profile of someone who would hurt a child. So, Why? well, white middle-aged man that's who typically will um, be a predator to a child. Really? And right away, when I moved to my permanent cell, which when we talk about cell, it was basically like the little studio here. It just had 12 bunk beds in it. Wow. So it wasn't a complete cell as you would think. Right, right, there's right. There's no toilets in there. There's no showers. You had to go down the hall for all that. Okay. It was military barracks. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like camp-like. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if we talk about the camp, that's a whole different animal because there it's I don't know if you remember the TV show MASH. Yeah. Kind of remembered me of that, reminded okay. me of that. Okay. It was, no one really had their hand on the steering wheel there. It was, the inmates really did truly run the place. They just came through a couple times a day to count you and make sure you were still there. Right. That was basically it. Right. There was lines painted on the ground. Just don't go past those lines. Okay. And even those lines, if you were doing work, you could cross them too. Right. It, really, it was, even the guards would say to us, if you're here at this camp, you should be home. 
Right. There's no, it's just a waste of money at this time. But what we did do, what the camps did do, we supplied a lot of the employment or the extra work to make the satellite mediums work. So typically like a camp is next to a, a higher security prison, okay. like a medium. And we, you know, everything comes through the camp. So my job, I was in charge uh, of the warehouse. So any single thing that got delivered to the prison, I was in charge of. Okay. Okay. The guy who's committing fraud, they're making me in charge of the warehouse. Right. Makes no sense, but. Hence the peppers. Right, 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 <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Just saying. Right. So, you know, we would get all the stuff and then it was our job to unpack it, repackage it, and then put it on these little trains, we called them, that they pull over in forklifts okay. to the medium okay. to make sure there's no contraband slipping in. Right things of that nature. So that's really yes. what the camp workers do. Okay. No, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, now did, so I know like in prison, there's like education available. So at your, like, would they kind of utilize you guys to kind of help teach certain things? Well, that's a great that question, sense? Tyra. Cause if you go on any site, you can go on the BOP.gov mm -hmm. and it will tell you, Oh, in this prison, they offer this and this and this total bullshit, yeah. total bullshit. There was a, I was in one, I was in three different prisons, Fort Dix, Lowe, McKean Camp, and Fairton Camp. At McKean, they did have a better education system. Okay. And it wasn't anything that they really did for the prisoners. But if myself, since I was a financial guy, I asked, can I teach the inmates finance? Right. So I had to come up with a whole curriculum. Okay. Get it approved. I did. And then I would teach finance yeah. to some of the guys. The best class I had was our current events class, which was great because we would just take current events and there'd be like, it depends, 17 of us, 20 of us sitting around on a Sunday morning and you didn't have to sign up. That's the other thing too. They don't you make you do like education. Just show up. Just show up. Yeah. You know, um, but we were sitting around and it was bizarre. I was sitting around with a, um, a private pilot, the head of the New York Carpenters Union, uh, a congressman or ex-congressman at that point because mm -hmm. he's in prison. Um, the guy who was in charge of the, all the VA hospitals in the United States. Right. So all this mind power, you know, yeah. brain power, Smart brain trust. Individuals. Amazing sure. to sit and just yeah. talk for an hour. Yeah. Um, but it was only if you wanted to do it. And yeah. that's where for me, you know, I say prison saved my life in a couple ways. One, I definitely got off the pills way before I got to prison. Well, not way, 30 days yeah. prior to. Um, but it also gave me the time. Imagining taking time out of your life, which you have young children and middle-aged children, not sure. middle-aged, but you know. They're like 40. No. Right. <laughs> um, you know, so imagine if you had time away where you didn't have to worry about an electric bill, a cell phone bill. You didn't even have a cell phone. Yeah. Where you can yeah. just concentrate on yourself. So for me, prison gave me the opportunity to completely look at myself, my life story, and change my life to know what I want to be when I got out. Yeah. A lot of guys don't do that. A lot of guys lay in bed nonstop, night and day. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of depression that happens. No. And, you, think? you know, obviously, <laughs> like, you know, mental health is a major issue. There's um, a lot of people there that probably should have been in a, a mental facility. health facility yeah. as opposed to a yeah, prison. Yeah, no, yes. I'm sure. So let me just shift gears a little bit. So like, let's go back to the bar, right? Mm -hmm. So you open this bar, um, you use someone else's finances that, mm -hmm. you know, you shouldn't have. Yes. And so how, what happens? How you, like, what, what did you do? Like, did you start at your company? Well, did you start it as an LLC, as a corporation? The bar? Yeah. Yes, the, the bar was started. Actually, yeah, it was, uh, no, it was actually a subchapter S company. Okay. So it was, I was the only shareholder okay. of the company. So started it up fully funded, of course, yeah. <laughs> with someone else's money. Yeah. Um, did it, remodeled the place. Uh, took me about nine months to turn it around. Start paying clients back. Mm -hmm. We were actually making payments to them. Okay. It wasn't until, I'm being honest, my life, right? It wasn't yeah. until my brother called the FBI and said I stole his inheritance. Mm. And they're like, why? So they, they didn't take him serious, but then they wanted, they said, well, let's just check the guy out. Right. So they go, they look at my finances and they say, wait a second, there's checks there from clients. The, 
as a as a registered investment advisor, yeah. I have a higher level of due diligence and a higher level of fiduciary responsibility. Yeah. And I'm not allowed to borrow money from clients and I'm not allowed to lend money to clients. Okay. Well, I did it, right? So everything and if I may, yeah. like aren't sure. you supposed to like if if under like what your practice is, aren't you supposed to also disclose if you're getting involved into another business? Or is that is that like a company? That's a company thing. Okay. Because gotcha. I owned my own company at the time. I was okay. my own registered okay. investment advisory. Gotcha. So I was the compliance guy too, which made it easy for me to right. steal the money. So it's not like you're you're working for so and so where you have to because I know a lot of these large companies, that's the case. You have to disclose Correct. if you're getting into another business. Correct. And it's up okay. to them to say, all right, well, you gotta decide one or the other. Okay. You can't do both. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I was I was everything. CEO, yeah. compliance guy, everything. Yeah. Um so yeah, it was I did that and um, so they start looking, they're like, well, you can't do that. Of course, they go to the clients and they're like, oh, well, we didn't know that. You know, now they're afraid. I mean, Homeland Security's knocking on your door and they want to interview. Yeah. You're shitting your pants. Yeah, you know? sure. So they're terrified. That's just the way it is. Yeah. And, um, and as I said, when they came to me, I said, yeah, I, I didn't deny it. Did I know it was wrong? Yeah, yeah. I know it was wrong. Do I think it should have been handled in civil court? Probably. Yeah. Probably more so than, than the criminal side, but it is what it is. So that's so interesting to me because, I mean, I'm familiar with a story where um, there's two gentlemen that have opened multiple companies together and they, they go under the same name. They just change, you know, whatever, like we'll just we'll call it a landscaping company. So it'll be landscaping one company and then it'll be hardscaping another company. Mm -hmm. and and they defraud people as they're going. Mm -hmm. And then they file for bankruptcy for that corporation. They'll then open another company and do the same thing. Um, so to hear like you've had this experience and like knowing of this other story where mm -hmm. honestly the district attorney doesn't want to be bothered. Um, right. it's, it's a very, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, no, it's, it's terrible because a lot of it can be handled <laughs> right at that level, yeah. you know, and should, could have I have fought with people and said, you know, this really needs civil. I was ready for my life to change. Okay. And I knew in my head, I thought, what are they going to give me for this? Two years? Yeah. I could use a two year break. I probably needed, you know, it was an adult timeout. Yeah. I could have used yeah. that, right? And a vacation. Yeah, a little vacation time. And you know, I figured with good time, what am I going to do, 18 months? But the judge, they, they hit you with everything. So this company you're talking about, I don't know who they are, but let me tell you something. They're gonna hit them with bankruptcy fraud. Mm -hmm. That adds like amazing amount of time to your, yeah. your stuff. Anything at all will add to this. And the federal government has zero Fs to give. Yeah. If they get a hold of this group, yeah. I will tell you right now, they're gonna chop them up. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I had an email the night before I pled guilty yeah. that said, we're only going to charge Mr. Boyle with a certain, it goes by numbers and they're going to say, we got, you know, so it looked like I was going to do 39 months. Okay. And I was like, all right, I can handle that because I knew I had the pill addiction. I was going to do a drug program, which would give me 12 extra months of good credit. Yeah. So I figured I could wheedle it down to about 20 months. Yeah. They hit me with so much more. Everything was an enhancement. Okay. You know, if the, yeah. my, my victims were over 50 years of age. They consider that elder abuse. Wow. So wow. I'm 53. Wait, over 50? I know, Tara, tell me it hit home with me. I'm thinking, I can't imagine that today <laughs> for me. I'm thinking, I'm 53, shit. But yeah. Um, no, I mean, and you know, it was wrong. Yeah, yeah, and, and like I said, I was wrong. And that I said that all along, and I just, I guess I expected some mercy, some leniency. I, I said to the judge, you know, I raised $10 million for my college. Yeah. I raised millions of dollars for my high school. Yeah. They did not look at, the, it was just like. Well, right. I mean, absolutely. You were on these boards, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, knowing you like I do, you were always like helping different charity organizations and whatnot. And it's interesting, you know, like you fucked up. Yeah. And people do that. So, you know, the fact that you are able to take that, learn from it, grow from it, own mm -hmm. it like yeah. sit here with me and talk about it like that yeah. that says a lot right. well it you says know? a lot to me simply because as i said a little bit ago i was always private i i was married twice and i sucked both times as a husband i really did for many reasons 
But probably the biggest reason was I was mentally absent. I could yeah. not share. I had no intimate conversations with my significant others. Yeah. Today, I'm a different man today. Yeah. And I'm proud of that. I'm yeah. happy about it too. No, it's. I mean, it's. A, it's a shame they missed out. But I mean, <laughs> cause in the sense of you know, you have two women that obviously fell in love with you enough to marry you, and they are both wonderful humans. Right, you know them. Right, I you know, know them. they're beautiful. They're, they're, beautiful, they're absolutely incredibly professional women. They're yeah, great. They're good awesome. mothers. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I. I personally couldn't say enough good things about both of them. Um, but it, you know, it's it's a really a shame that this addiction yeah, and that's what ruled it, your life. It was addiction, and there's people say, well, why the addiction? And there's childhood traumas that I learned, and a lot of people, you know, I'm sure if my family sees this interview or whatever, they'd be like, oh, you know, there'd be a hundred different names they would call me for it. But the reality of it is, a lot of things happened to me as a child that shouldn't happen to any child. Yeah abandonment issues, you know, yeah. neglect issues. And I love my parents. Yesterday was my, would have been my father's 92nd birthday, yeah. and I still idolize him to this day. But he and I did things together that there's no way in God's green earth that we should have did together. Right. Just craziness. From a father-son perspective. From a father-son perspective. Yeah. It was just, you know, it was wrong. Yeah. I still love the man, yeah. and he's my father, but he had his own faults. But so, you know, the sins of the father pass along to the son, right? Yeah. So I had to learn what all those underlying things were. And I'm thankful I had those 1,547 days. Yeah. Because yeah. they allowed me the time to really look at myself. And it wasn't easy. Yeah. It wasn't easy. Yeah. And especially in a place like that, you're really not allowed to cry. You're not allowed to show emotion too much. Sure. But I did it. And yeah, today I'm a better, and that's the things I promised at the time, my wife and my children, and thank God my children are still with me. I still be a better husband, better father, and a better person. Yeah. So I come out as a better person and a better father. I'm just not a better husband because I'm not married. Right, that's all right, you <laughs> so. know, as long as you have respect, yeah. you know, for your exes and whatnot. But it sounds like, you know, it sounds like you really learned from this. So, and now you're willing to take this, you're, you're willing to, help other people that, you know, have the same mistakes that they made mm -hmm. or similar to land them in a position that they're looking at federal prison. Right. And um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting opportunity. I, I will say, I, I wish I knew the name of the movie, I don't, but it's, I guess, um, Will Farrell and uh, Kevin Hart, there's a movie about- Someone had texted me about, yeah, but I don't <laughs> remember, yeah. yeah. He's getting ready for federal prison. You know, they right. make it a comedy. So right. I did catch a couple of clips of it. And my, cousin, my cousin emailed me. He says, oh, you're too late for this, <laughs> for your business. He said that was a movie a couple years ago. Well, yeah. it sounds like you, you have a different perspective for it. You know? Well, I certainly, I have the inside perspective because I lived it, yeah. you know? And in this business, the federal consulting business, uh, prison consulting business, a lot of ex-guards do it. Yeah. You know, not that they, you know, they, they or have master's degree in being sadistic, but now they're also benefiting on the other side of it. It's terrible. And they really don't know the day-to-day -day operations. I mean, they have a good handle on it, but once again, they don't know how to use the phone. Yeah. They don't understand the fact that if you have a young child, maybe you need, because when you call home, it says this calls from a federal prison, blah, blah. Right. Maybe you didn't, you're told your child you're, you're going away to college or something. Right. And you don't want that message. So how about you say, it's going to be, I want my phone message to be in Spanish. So my seven-year-old just hears all of a sudden, whatever it means right. in Spanish. Right. And then, they're, Dad, what's that? Oh, I don't know, honey. It's nothing, you know, whatever. And you right. keep talking and just blow it off. And then the kid doesn't remember any of it. Right. You know? Yeah. So if that's what they're choosing yeah, to do. Yeah, well, right. Exactly. And that's, that's what you're saying. You're, like, looking out for the family in this. Yeah. Um, well, this is a good opportunity to, to wrap up and allow you to like, you know, just how do we find your company? Is there a website? There, there is a website, um, BOPConsult.com, BOPConsult, C-O-N-S-U-L-T.com. Okay. And then from there you can hit all our social, we okay. Twitter, TikTok, and as you know, my son's into all this and he set it all up, so. Yeah. But we do have it and I'm available 24 seven. 
you call me on the phone, you have questions. As I said, I hope none of my personal friends and family ever have to deal with this, but should they? It's just a good way of saying, you know, life, number one, life goes on. Yeah. You're going to get through this and you can do it together and hang in there. Best days are yet to come. Yeah, absolutely. We all have a curveball once in a while. Yeah. So, yeah. Bill, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Tyra. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be able to do it. Absolutely. I wish you all the best in your future in this new endeavor. Thank you. And you guys, um, you can hear more stories like this by picking up your copy of The Street Smart Side of Business. And we will see you next time.